Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. This is the House of Law and I'm attorney Al Jumrani. Today I'm happy to bring you a new video. Today we'll talk about void and voidable marriages and legal separation. By the way, I'd like to say thank you very much for those who have watched my videos, for those who have subscribed to my channel and uh, I really appreciate the support guys. Now if you're new to the channel, please go over my videos, watch them and I hope you learn something from them. Now, if you're enjoying your time here, please consider subscribing and please click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case I upload a new video. Alright, so let's begin. So what are the void marriages under the family code? So first, are the void marriages due to the absence of essential and formal requisites? Remember the essential and formal requisites? The essential, and the essential requisites are legal capacity of the parties who must be a man and a woman as well as the consent freely given. The formal requisites are authority of the solemnizing officer, marriage license, and the marriage ceremony. Now, under Article 35, 1, 2, and 3, marriages whereby the parties do not have legal capacity to give consent, also where the solemnizing officer does not have the authority to solemnize marriage, and those marriages without a marriage license are void marriages. Now, as to that um, defect of the absence of the authority of the solemnizing officer there is an exception the exception is that when the parties to the marriage believed in good faith that the solemnizing officer had authority to do so meaning to say they believe that he was a priest or that they thought he was a real judge so that marriage will not be considered void instead it will be considered valid now notice something else well the absence of a marriage ceremony does not make the contract void because it's not one of those mentioned here under Article 35 of the Family Code. Alright, so I hope you take note of that. Now, the next void marriages are the bigamous and polygamous marriages. Now, these marriages are marriages that were uh, contracted by the parties or by any one of the parties during the subsistence of a previous marriage. That's why they're called bigamous or polygamous marriages. Now, the next void marriages are the void marriages due to mistake by one party to the marriage as to the identity of the other. Now, the next void marriages are the incestuous marriages or marriages between ascendants and descendants and between siblings of the full or half-blood. And next void marriages are those which are void for being contrary to public policy such as marriages between uh, step siblings marriages between the adoptive parent and the spouse of the adoptive child okay now the next uh, classification of void marriages are the void second marriages under article 53 so remember that a marriage can be terminated by annulment or by an action for declaration of nullity but the law particularly article 52 of the family code requires that there must be a partition as well as distribution of the conjugal or community property as well as the delivery of the presumptive legitim of the children and the same must be recorded in the proper registry of deeds but if these requirements are not satisfied or complied with then the subsequent marriage which may be contracted by either or both of the parties to the previous marriage shall be considered void okay it's a technical requirement but uh, a mandatory requirement just the same okay now remember that actions to declare a marriage void do not prescribe okay but because this action is personal to the parties the right of action is lost when either or both spouses die Okay, now for purposes of remarriage, there must be a declaration of nullity of marriage or annulment of marriage as, uh, also applied in voidable marriages because the parties cannot just assume or declare that the marriage is void for the ground stated under the law. There must be a judicial decree or a judicial declaration to that effect before the parties to the said marriage can remarry. Alright, 
the next category of void marriages are the void marriage due to psychological incapacity under article 36 of the family code so what is this concept of psychological incapacity according to jurisprudence it is the inability to comply with the essential marital obligations of marriage of one or both of the parties furthermore it was said that it must be more than just a difficulty refusal or neglect in the performance of the marital obligations and lastly, it must be characterized by gravity, juridical antecedents, and incurability. Okay, let's understand these concepts more. So these are the guidelines in declaring a marriage void due to psychological incapacity. First is that the burden of proof rests with the plaintiff. And this is consistent with our basic rules of evidence that the party who alleges the affirmative of an issue has the burden to prove the same. Next is that the root cause of the psychological incapacity must be medically or clinically identified, alleged in the complaint, sufficiently proven by experts, and explained in the decision. So clearly psychological incapacity or at least the ground for psychological incapacity cannot be assumed okay, or cannot be simply inferred. Next is that the incapacity must be existing at the time of the celebration of the marriage. This simply means it is rooted to some cause or some disorder or some ground existing prior to or at least at the time of the marriage, although it may have manifested only after the marriage. Okay. Next is that the incapacity must be permanent or incurable. In other words, it is not temporary and cannot be cured by, by say, by medicine or by some therapy. All right. Next is that uh, the illness is grave enough to prevent okay, the party from assuming the essential marital obligations. So what are these essential marital obligations? These are the obligations to live together, to observe mutual love, respect, and fidelity, and to render mutual help and support. Now, additional guidelines are the interpretations of the National Appellate Matrimonial Tribunal of the Catholic Church shall be given uh, great respect. Although, of course, if the parties were not um, married under uh, Catholic rights, then, of course, you don't need the interpretation of the National Appellate Matrimonial Tribunal of the Catholic Church. Now, the last guideline or requirement is that the trial court must order the prosecutor and the solicitor general to appear for the state. And they do not just file their appearance, but they must also actively participate in the proceedings. Okay. Now, speaking of expert witnesses or that the case or that the ground for psychological incapacity must be clinically and medically proven therefore suggesting that there should be an expert witness what is the rule then on expert witness are they or is an expert witness really necessary well in the case of Ngote versus Ute, GR number 161793 dated February 13 2009 the Supreme Court said that opinions of experts like psychologists are important evidence and carries weight and may in some cases be decisive in a case. The actual medical examination should be dispensed with only if the totality of evidence presented is enough to support a finding of psychological incapacity. So clearly the expert testimony as a general rule is required okay, to prove the case at least the incurability of the psychological capacity okay next is as an exception that medical examination or expert testimony may be dispensed with okay, if the totality of the evidence presented is enough to support a finding of psychological incapacity now as to whether the evidence of the plaintiff is sufficient or enough to establish psychological incapacity that really is uh, a matter for the court to decide okay so sometimes the rule is the more the merrier but no it's not really the more the merrier but it's the weight and the credibility of these testimonies so again remember that expert testimony or the expert witness is as a rule required okay that's the preferred way of establishing the gravity and incurability of uh, the psychological incapacity but 
okay in case that the expert witness or medical examination is not presented at least the plaintiff must have submitted or offered in evidence sufficient um, basis for which the court can find or can make a finding as to psychological incapacity all right let's look at at this a hypothetical problem or is it a hypothetical problem let's see five years after getting married the marriage between mark and jennifer is everything but happy jennifer discovers that mark was maintaining another or meeting another woman and this caused them a lot of conflicts which also affected the children tired of mark's infidelity jennifer left the conjugal home and filed a petition to declare the marriage void on the ground of mark's psychological incapacity is infidelity a manifestation of psychological incapacity what do you think so let's look at the answer according to the case of castillo versus republic gr number 214064 february 6 2017 irreconcilable differences sexual infidelity so emphasis on sexual infidelity or perversion emotional immaturity and irresponsibility and the like do not by themselves warrant a finding of psychological incapacity under article 36 as the same may only be due to a person's refusal or unwillingness to assume the essential obligations of marriage in order for sexual infidelity to constitute a psychological incapacity the respondents and faithfulness must be established as a manifestation of a disordered personality completely preventing the respondent from discharging the essential obligations of the marital state there must be proof of a natal or supervening disabling factor that effectively incapacitated him from complying with the obligation to be faithful to his spouse it is indispensable that the evidence must show a link medical or the like between the acts that manifest psychological incapacity and the psychological disorder itself all right so so i hope that's clear that mere psychological or mere sexual infidelity mere uh, irreconcilable differences or even emotional immaturity and irresponsibility if not connected to some psychological disorder which can be traced prior to the marriage will not constitute psychological incapacity okay as a ground for nullifying the marriage all right but note uh in Calo versus fernandez gr number 166357 dated january 14 2015 the supreme court seemed to give article 36 a liberal construction rather than a very strict construction so as the supreme court said article 36 of the family code must not be so strictly and too literally read and applied given the clear intent of the drafters to adopt its enacted version of less specificity obviously to enable some resiliency in its application instead every court should approach the issue of nullity not on the basis of a priori assumptions predilections or generalizations but according to its own facts in recognition of the verity that no case would be on all fours or the same as the next one in the field of psychological incapacity as a ground for the nullity of marriage so that's a directive or a mandate uh, made by the supreme court or given by the supreme court to lower courts to particularly consider the facts and the circumstances and not to apply uh, the guidelines set for other cases in this particular case before them okay, so it should be a case-to-case -case basis and to give uh, true meaning to the intent of the drafters of the code on uh, using psychological incapacity as a ground for declaring a marriage now anyway. all right now next is let's discuss declaration of presumptive death as a ground for terminating a marriage so what are the requisites of a valid second marriage after or due to the presumptive death of 
uh, the absent spouse well first the absent spouse has been missing for four consecutive years or two consecutive years where there is danger of death okay so what are those instances when there is a danger of death well these are if you will remember uh, my, my video you can watch my video on absence so there is a danger of death when uh, the person was a passenger in an airplane or in a ship which was feared to have crashed in the case of the airplane or which was feared to have sunk or to have met a shipwreck in the case of a ship no? also if uh, the person was in the middle of war or in the line of battle and so there was also a fear of death or danger of death so if the person uh, was missing for two consecutive years and he was last seen or known to have been in that position then uh, two years would be enough to uh, declare him presumptively dead but otherwise uh, four years would be enough for as long as the years are consecutive now next is that the present spouse wishes to remarry that's why uh, the present spouse will first have to file an action to declare the absent spouse presumptively dead now the present spouse must have a well-founded belief that the absent spouse is dead okay more on this requirement in a bit now also the present spouse must initiate a summary proceeding for the declaration of presumptive death and a decision is rendered therein all right now the case of republic versus cantor uh, gives us the uh, meaning or the interpretation of the well-founded belief that the absent spouse is dead so here the supreme court said that the law did not define what is meant by well-founded belief it depends upon the circumstances of each particular case its determination so to speak remains on a case-to-case -case basis to be able to comply with this requirement the present spouse must prove that his or her belief was the result of diligent and reasonable efforts and inquiries to locate the absent spouse and that based on these efforts and circumstances he she believes that under the circumstances the absent spouse is already dead it requires exertion of active effort not a mere passive one so in this case the husband left the conjugal dwelling after a fight and had never been seen for at least four years but here the supreme court said that the well-founded belief was not established because there was no diligent and reasonable effort to look for the husband considering that uh, the present spouse the wife uh, could have easily checked like by you know checking up with his relatives with husband's relatives or maybe going to uh, the places that the husband had uh, you know, reportedly uh, been seen or had frequented too so here the supreme court said that it is not a mere passive uh, effort okay? you do not just wait and sit idly by and after the lapse of four years declare the absent spouse as presumptively dead there must be an active effort to look for and to contact the absent spouse and that is the meaning of well-founded belief all right now let's talk about voidable marriages so this can be found under article 45 of the family code so in your loan contracts a voidable contract is a valid contract until it is annulled okay so that's why the action to void a marriage or to void a voidable marriage is an action for annulment or annulment of marriage all right so again this can be found in article 45 and if you look at these grounds you will notice that they affect or go into okay the consent of the parties or the consent of a party to the contract of marriage so first is that the party in whose behalf it is sought when to say the action for annulment is sought okay is or was 18 years of age or over but below 21 and the marriage was solemnized without parental consent okay so if uh, the child had uh, ratified the marriage despite uh, the lack of parental consent then there is no 
uh, ground to declare the marriage void. Okay, so it is merely voidable. Next is if either party is of unsound mind. Also, when there was fraud in obtaining consent of either party. Also, when the consent was vitiated because it was obtained through force, intimidation, and undue influence. Also, when uh, the parties or one of the parties to the contract has physical inability or was physically incapable okay, to consummate the marriage. Also, when either party was afflicted with STD found to be serious or incurable and this was concealed okay, by by the person who or by the party who is afflicted with such std okay now in any of these cases however okay, the party who has the right to file the action for annulment may ratify or condone the situation or the ground so for example in the case of uh, the marriage of a party to a contract who was 18 to 21 years old at the time of the marriage if uh, despite the lack of parental consent he or she stayed in the marriage that can be considered as ratification so there's no more need or there's no more ground to annul the marriage next is when uh, after or during the lucid interval of the party who was of unsound mind and upon knowledge that he or she was mar is married to this person, he or she ratifies it or stays with that person, then the marriage can no longer be annulled. Also, when despite the discovery of, of fraud or despite the cessation of the forced intimidation or undue influence, okay, the aggrieved party or the party who has a ground or reason to annul the contract stays and ratifies it then the marriage can no longer be annulled and also when uh, the party to the marriage who was supposed to be physically incapable of consummating the marriage okay, is able to consummate the marriage then the contract can no longer be annulled and lastly if despite knowledge that the other spouse has a sexually transmitted disease uh, this spouse who had a right or who had the opportunity to file the action for annulment stays then there can be considered a ratification or condonation of the situation all right now what are the defenses so first as i've said is a ratification and the other one is that uh, prescription so the prescription for annulment of cases annulment of marriage is five years Okay, so we mentioned about fraud earlier. So what can be considered as fraud? So first is non-disclosure of a previous conviction by final judgment of a crime involving moral turpitude. Okay, also concealment by the wife that she was pregnant at the time of marriage by another man. Okay, not the husband. Also concealment of an STD at the time of the marriage. Also concealment of drug addiction habitual alcoholism, homosexuality, or lesbianism at the time of marriage. So only these facts or only these circumstances can be hidden and can be considered fraud. Any other information or any other fact not so disclosed will not be considered fraud. Okay, problem. Mila filed an action to annul his marriage to Arthur. She claims that Arthur is a homosexual and his homosexual activities have become too obvious and Mila claims that Arthur's homosexuality constitutes fraud so will the petition prosper so the answer is of course the case of Almilor versus RTC of Las Piñas here the Supreme Court said that no the petition will not prosper the law is clear a marriage may be annulled when the consent of either party was obtained by fraud such as concealment of homosexuality. Nowhere in the lower court's decision was it proven by preponderance of evidence that Manuel was a homosexual at the onset of his marriage and that he deliberately hid such fact to his wife. It is the concealment of homosexuality 
and not homosexuality per se that vitiates the consent of the innocent party. Such concealment presupposes bad faith and intent to defraud the other party in giving consent to the marriage. So if there was no concealment, then uh, there is no ground for annulment because the law here considers as ground not the homosexuality but rather the concealment or the hiding of that homosexual behavior. Okay, now let's talk about legal separation and here we are talking about failed marriages. Okay, so sadly, you know, uh, some good things never last. So legal separation presupposes that the marriage has failed. Now, by the way, the difference of legal separation from annulment as well as nullity of marriage is that here the marriage vows or the marriage tie is not severed so the parties to this marriage would still be considered legally married although they are legally separated okay so as defined legal separation is the suspension of the common marital life both as to person and property by judicial decree on any grounds recognized by law okay so it is the suspension of the common marital life okay why is it simply a suspension can it not be a permanent suspension or a permanent termination that's what i said no it is not a permanent cessation of marriage but it's a temporary suspension okay why temporary because the parties can reconcile okay and then get back together so we'll talk more about the reconcilia reconciliation in a bit. Okay. Also, the uh, suspension of the marital bond here refers not only as to the persons of the parties but also as to their property. So there is a division or a judicial, judicially ordered separation of the property regime. Now, the grounds are recognized by law. Okay. So outside of these grounds, then there can be no legal separation. Okay, so let's now look at the difference between separation de facto as well as separation in fact. Or, or separation in fact. Okay? The difference between legal separation and separation de facto or separation in fact. So first is that legal separation is decreed by the court. Separation de facto is actual separation without any judicial or court decree. Also, legal separation dissolves the property relations of the party and removes the guilty party's capacity to inherit from the innocent spouse. Separation de facto has no such effect on the property relations and capacity to succeed. Okay, now distinguished from annulment or marriage, in legal separation, the marriage is not defective as the grounds arise only after the marriage. Okay. In annulment, the marriage is defective from inception as the grounds existed prior to or at the time of marriage. In legal separation, the parties may not remarry. In annulment or nullity of marriage, the parties can remarry. Because, as I've said, in annulment or nullity of marriage, the marriage is terminated. And like in legal separation, they are just separated in person or property. Okay, but not in marriage all right so what are the grounds for legal separation so first we have repeated physical violence or grossly abusive conduct directed against the petitioner a common child or a child of the petitioner also physical violence or moral pressure to compel the petitioner to change religious or political affiliation also, an attempt of respondent to corrupt or induce the petitioner, a common child or a child of the petitioner, to engage in prostitution or connivance in such corruption or inducement. Also, final judgment sentencing the respondent to imprisonment of more than six years, even if pardoned. Okay, so notice that uh, these grounds change the dynamics of the marital life. You know? So there is now physical violence. There is now moral pressure, moral violence, and uh, of course, corruption of uh, the petitioner. And the petitioner here could be the husband or the wife. You know? And of course, when there is final judgment, as to okay, keep them apart for at least six years. 
Now, the other grounds are drug addiction or habitual alcoholism of the respondent, okay? lesbianism or homosexuality of the respondent. Okay, now, these uh, circumstances or grounds are also found in annulment, but if only they were concealed at the time of marriage. So here, uh, drug addiction, habitual alcoholism, and lesbianism or homosexuality, they happen after the marriage and during the you know, marital union. Okay, so next is contracting by the respondent of a subsequent bigamous marriage, whether in the Philippines or abroad. Okay, this is different from bigamous marriages under void marriages because uh, the party who can file that would be the second spouse. Okay? But here, this is filed by the first spouse. Okay? So, because the marriage between the first spouse and the respondent in this case was valid at the time and still valid even if the respondent had contracted a second marriage. It is the second marriage that is void. Okay? So, uh, that's why as to the first spouse or the spouse in the first marriage her remedy is only legal separation okay next is sexual infidelity or perversion okay. um, earlier we cited a case under psychological capacity that sexual infidel infidelity per se is not psychological incapacity but it can fall under or it can fall as a ground for legal separation and next is attempt by the respondent against the life of the petitioner. Okay, so clearly, you know, you cannot possibly remain in a marriage when your spouse has attempted against your life. All right. Next is abandonment by respondent without justifiable cause for more than one year. All right. Okay. Now let's look at some illustrative cases. In Nahera versus Nahera decided. Uh, July 3, 2009 Petitioner filed a petition for nullity of marriage with alternative prayer for legal separation alleging that her husband respondent was a drunkard and a marijuana addict who abandoned her and lived in the US. The trial court and court of appeals found that the grounds only established legal separation and ordered the dissolution of the conjugal partnership. Petitioner just the same appealed. Here, the Supreme Court ruled that the respondent's abandonment to the justifiable cause for more than one year was only a ground for legal separation and not for nullity of marriage under Article 36 of the Family Code. Because, again, um, these acts that destroy the marriage per se cannot be considered a ground for psychological incapacity if they are not coupled with some medical finding pointing to a psychological or mental disorder that you know renders uh, the respondent spouse for, uh, you know in a, unable to perform the marital obligations but if uh, these behaviors are only a refusal or a neglect to perform the marital obligations then they will not fall under psychological capacity but they could be considered or used as grounds for legal separation as what happened here in the case of Nahera versus Nahera. Okay, another case is Dedel versus Court of Appeals decided January 29, 2004. David and Sharon were married and had four children. Sharon had illicit affairs with other men. One of them was a Jordanian national with whom Sharon had two children. Sharon abandoned her family and joined the Jordanian when he returned to Jordan together with their two kids. Okay, now the SE rule that the evidence presented only makes out a ground for legal separation, not psychological incapacity. Sexual infidelity or perversion and abandonment do not by themselves constitute psychological incapacity. It must be shown <coughs> that these acts are manifestations of a disordered personality which make respondent completely unable to discharge the essential marital obligations all right next case for purposes of illustrating the grounds of uh, psychological capacity is the case of Enkiam versus Ong 
decided last October 23, 2006. Here, Ong and Kiam and Lucita Ong were married and had three children, but Ong filed a petition for legal separation against Ong Eng, alleging that she suffered physical violence, threats, intimidation, and grossly abusive conduct. Ong Eng claimed that the petition should be denied because Ong only wanted to wrest control of the conjugal partnership. Also, he claimed that Ong likewise abandoned the family. Okay, so is this a case of in pari delicto? Here, the Supreme Court ruled that the ground of physical violence was established. As to the, the defense that Ong abandoned the family, the abandon contemplated by Article 55 is abandonment without justifiable cause. Here, Ong left Eng, okay, or Ong Eng, because of his abusive conduct. Okay, so the uh, infractions committed by uh, Ong Eng, okay, was used as ground for um, legal separation because the supposed abandonment by the other was due to a justifiable cause. Okay, and that is, of course, the behavior the abusive behavior of Ong Eng all right now what are the defenses in legal separation so first is condonation where the aggrieved party has condoned the offense or act complained of condonation of one act however does not necessarily mean condonation of others so if there are several acts committed and um, only one act was condoned or out of these several acts one act was not condoned so that one act that was not condoned can still be used as a ground for legal separation all right but as a rule if uh, there was condonation uh, the fact should be examined carefully if that condonation was or is considered as condonation of the all previous acts but if there is no such uh, evidence or it cannot be shown that this is uh, one condonation for all, then uh, the other acts which were not condoned can still be used as ground for legal separation. Next is consent, okay, which means that the aggrieved party has consented to the commission of the offense or act complained of. For example, uh, drug addiction by the respondent spouse. If the complaining spouse had given the consent to that bad you know addiction then of course he, she or he can no longer be heard to complain all right consent here is conformity in advance by a spouse to the offense of the other spouse consent is made before the offense but condonation is made after the offense so that's the difference between consent and condonation Okay, next is connivance. So, as a defense, connivance is uh, where uh, there is connivance between the parties in the commission of the offense or act constituting the ground for legal separation. It is the agreement okay, to commit the ground of legal separation. So, for example, sexual infidelity. So, if they decided to enter or to make their marriage an open relationship, so there was connivance because they agreed to um, you know, to the ground for legal separation, which is the sex, uh, sexual infidelity. Next is recrimination. Okay, in other words, uh, mutual guilt. So, where both parties have given ground for legal separation. So, the ground committed by one may be different from the ground committed by the other, but both of them will cancel each other out. So, this is based on the principle that a party must come to court with clean hands now another ground is collusion where there is collusion between the parties to obtain the decree of legal separation okay so this is different from connivance because connivance is agreement to commit the ground of legal separation or to commit the act which can be used as a ground for legal separation but collusion is the agreement to obtain Okay, the degree of legal separation. So how? Well, it can be through committing the ground for legal separation. It, it could be by making it appear that a ground has been committed and also by suppressing evidence of a valid defense. It is as if the defendant or the respondent is just giving away the case 
for the plaintiff okay so that's collusion now the other ground or the other defense to a legal a separation case is prescription okay where the action is barred by prescription that is filed for more than five years from occurrence of the cause so the prescriptive period for legal separation is the same as the prescriptive period for voidable marriages or for an, an action for annulment of marriage all right so let's look at some illustrative cases again on legal separation so <clears throat> in the case of bugayong versus hines decided december 28 1956 an old case but still a good one benjamin bugayong and leonila hines were married and first lived in sampaloc manila leonila however asked that she be allowed to go to pangasinan to live with her sister and to pursue college education while separated benjamin learned that leonila had sexual affairs with other men he went to see her in dagupan and confronted her but she denied it that night they slept together the following day he again asked her but this time she left him for good benjamin filed a petition for legal separation but it was dismissed on the ground of condemnation so was their condemnation committed or done through having you know sex so here the supreme court affirmed the dismissal there was in fact condemnation according to the supreme court applying u.s jurisprudence it held that a single voluntary act of marital intercourse between the parties ordinarily is sufficient to constitute condonation because you know a sexual act is intimate and uh, one must voluntarily do it and must have the heart to do it so clearly the supreme court uh, deemed that as condonation of the sins of uh, Unila. Alright, so that's the case of Bugayong versus Hines. Next is the case of De Ocampo versus Florenciano. Also an old case, but still a good one. This was decided last February 23, 1960. So De Ocampo and Florenciano were married. De Ocampo filed a petition for legal separation against his wife, Florenciano, whom he caught having sex with another man. De Ocampo signified that he will file a complaint for legal separation and Florenciano gave her conformity okay, to the legal separation case provided she is not charged with adultery which is of course a criminal act now the Ocampo's petition okay, the, uh, however was dismissed by the trial court and the court of appeals on the ground of collusion so was there collusion when Florenciano gave her conformity to the petition or complaint for legal separation here the supreme court said no there was no collusion it ruled that a mere desire to get the legal separation and failure to make a defense is not by itself collusion independently of the desire of florenciano adultery was established hence legal separation should still be decreed okay in other words that collusion may be useless okay if the act or the ground for legal separation could still be or was in fact established in the case okay so the court can just disregard the collusion because you know no amount of collusion uh, will erase the fact that the ground for legal separation was committed like in this case adultery by the wife all right now more this time let's talk about procedural matters so the prescriptive period for an action for legal separation is five years from the accrual of the cause of action in other words from the time of the commission of the offense or from the time of a discovery of uh, the ground for legal separation now next is uh, there must be or there is a required cooling off period and this is six months after the filing of the petition the purpose of this is uh, to see if the parties you know uh, could have you know, reconciled and uh, the petitioner or the offended spouse may have uh, condoned or forgiven the respondent or the offending spouse okay next efforts toward reconciliation must be made and this is to be taken by the court and may even continue after the six months cooling off period also no confession of judgment is allowed okay, because of course that would be considered collusion 
and also the provisional remedies allowed in legal separation are physical separation of the parties administration of uh, the property by, uh, by, by by the spouse who is appointed by the court and also support pendente lite for of course the petitioner spouse and also for their common children now what are the effects of legal separation so with a decree of legal separation the parties can now live separately but the marriage bond remains so they are still mr and mrs so and so now the property regime shall be dissolved and liquidated so the guilty spouse shall not have a right to the net profits of the properties okay also the custody of the minor children shall be given to the innocent spouse okay as a general rule unless of course there is a reason a valid reason as found or affirmed by the court that the innocent spouse is not fit to take custody of the minor children also the guilty spouse shall be disqualified to inherit ab intestato okay in other words through interstate succession and provisions in the will made before the legal separation shall be revoked the exception here is that after the uh, legal separation and with knowledge of this effect or consequence of legal separation the innocent spouse or the offended spouse executes okay, a will a second will and this time uh, indicating or making dispositions in favor of uh, the offending husband or sorry offending spouse okay? not to generalize husbands but let's use offending spouse in the said will then of course that second disposition in favor of the offending spouse should be given effect next the mutual support shall cease but the court may award the innocent spouse alimony okay and this alimony is like support you know alimony as a term is usually used in divorce proceedings but we also apply this illegal separation and uh, it is called financial support to the offended or to the innocent spouse next donations and designations as beneficiary in life insurance in favor of the guilty spouse shall also be nullified all right so this is the uh, ultimate defense uh, to a legal separation so reconciliation is a joint manifest well reconciliation is getting back together so a joint manifestation is or may be filed and under oath with a court which rendered the decree of legal separation okay if still pending the legal separation proceeding shall be terminated if already final and executory then the decree of legal separation shall be set aside now with reconciliation the parties or the spouses can now live together again but separation of property and revocation of testamentary provisions in the will donations and insurance shall remain except if the innocent spouse revives okay, the uh, property regime or uh, reinstates the guilty spouse in the life insurance policy or again as i said earlier if the innocent spouse despite the a decree of legal separation issues or executes a second will and makes dispositions in favor of the guilty spouse all right so those are the effects of reconciliation all right so that ends my video on void and voidable marriages or what i'd like to call together as defective marriages and legal separation or what I would like to describe as the failed marriage okay so I hope you learned something today in this video uh, please watch out for more videos about the family code so we will finish family code with a series of videos now if you have any topic in mind uh, please comment please tell me what videos you like me to make and uh, also you can you know follow me on my accounts uh, in Facebook, I have a page there. It's called Attorney Al Jumrani. And of course, you're here right now. You're watching me through my channel here on YouTube. And it's the House of Law. Alright, so if you enjoyed this video, please like, drop a like, 
please subscribe if you haven't yet and please click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case i upload my next video so that's it from me thank you very much for watching laging tatandaan isip ay buksan alamin ang batas